So hello and welcome to this NPTO course entitled 20th Century Fiction. We will start with a new text today in this particular lecture and that will be uh, Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Jalloway. Uh, we have already mentioned this novel uh, very briefly in our last lecture we talked about the whole idea of epiphany in modernism. Uh, that lecture was obviously spent looking at some of the texts which we have covered so far including the love song on J. R. of Prufrock, um, Eliot's early poetry such as Preludes and also the James Stewart's short story um, Araby. So epiphany is a very big feature in modernism as you've seen, uh, especially because we see how the human self, the human subject is situated or, or submerged rather in a sea of machines and how you know, the sentient reaction to that um, in a situation among machines is something which epiphany captures quite well. It's a neural phenomenon, it's obviously cognitive neural in quality, but it's also equally existential in quality. Uh, it either elevates you existentially or uh, it gives you an idea or knowledge of your nothingness, which is more commonly the case in modernism. Now, Mrs. Jalloway um, is a short story, uh, is, is a novel about various things, but primarily is a novel about uh, the lack of empathy uh, in a post war, post First World War London. Uh, and the, the setting, the historical setting is very important because this is a, certain, a, a metropolis which is mourning in quality. So it's full of mourners and survivors. Uh, it's full of people who either lost their beloved ones who come back from the war injured. So um, it has many characters. I mean the obvious protagonist is Mrs. Jalloway. Uh, I mean the whole idea, the whole story is she's setting up a party for people to come and discuss. Uh, it's a very genteel society of people, um, upper middle class Londoners. But while this party is going on, the preparation for the party is going on, we have another sub-story which uh, actually becomes more important than this particular story. And that sub-story is one of Septimus Smith, who is essentially a war veteran who's come back from the First World War and who suffers some trauma and anxiety and depression. Uh, so he is what we would now call a PTSD victim, post-traumatic stress disorder victim. But obviously at that time that this term wasn't in vogue, no one quite knew uh, what the problem with the soldiers were and there were various terms which were used randomly to describe them, to classify them, one of which was shell shock. Uh, shell shock was a term uh, when it was rampantly used in the First World War, after the First World War to talk about victims who suffered from nervous trauma. Uh, but it was obviously a very insufficient term, it, it hardly captured anything. Uh, in terms of the real problem because you know many occasions we had soldiers who never really been exposed to shells uh, physically but then they still saw from post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma in that particular case. Now uh, what Septimus's situation reveals is the obvious medical uh, inability to, to, to engage with these victims, to engage with these uh, you know, suffering subjects. But also it gives you a sense of the lack of empathy and that's what I just mentioned, uh, the primary aim, the primary objective, the primary theme of this novel, the absence of empathy. Uh, now like most modernist works, like most cult modernist works, so high, high modernist works, this particular novel is set in one day, a one Joycean day. Uh, as you know, it's become famous for the use of James Joyce. Uh, you know, even Ulysses is set in a very similar kind of setting. It's just one calendar day. But the calendar day or the one day is uh, the day to day is, is hardly important over here because what is more important, what is infinitely more important, is the different existential passages of time inhabited by the characters. And uh, which brings us back to one of the old theses on time that we have touched upon already, the only Bergsonian understanding of uh, clock time and real time. Uh, clock time being obviously standard time, time shared by everyone, time as in a digit of time, time as in a date of time. Uh, and real time or psychological time is obviously dirty by Bergson. It is the psychological situatedness of the subject apropos of time. So how are you located in a particular mental time frame and a mental time map, right? So that is obviously, it can be as well as out of, be out of sync with, uh, with clock time and that being in sync, out of sync with clock time is something which we see quite often in Mrs. Jalloway. Now this whole idea of being out of sync with time, uh, it's not just a philosophical thing in Mrs. Jalloway, it becomes a very real experiential thing uh, as we can see uh, suffered by uh, Septimus Smith. He comes back from the war, he was obviously suffering from trauma and anxiety and depression uh, but more importantly he feels completely alienated from this metropolis, he cannot connect to anything in the metropolis, right? And this inability to connect is important because there's obviously a medical condition which is uh, uh, obviously preventing him from, from connecting to people but also it becomes a political condition, it becomes like 
you know, very much part of the uh, political, cultural condition of the time, where the soldiers who came back from the war hardly received uh, any, any welcoming treatment, hardly received any experience of integration or reintegration for the matter. So Septimus remains a very, very unaccommodated figure in Mrs. Dalloway. So in other words, this novel is all about unaccommodation. This novel is all about, also about uh, the whole process of being out of sync with the system, or being incompatible with the system, temporally incompatible, spatially incompatible, culturally incompatible, and of course existentially incompatible. And this existential incompatibility is something which we see coming over and over again uh, in many modernist works. We saw, for instance, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where the whole politics of procrastination was based on its incompatibility, agree of this in incompatibility, where Prufrock could not go to the room, a woman come and go talking and make lines law because he cannot fit in. Uh, he cannot be, see himself compatible to that kind of a cultural imaginary, uh, the cultural space. Now, similarly, uh, Septimus too, uh, he has a degree of masculinity crisis. He, he travels, he, he shifts from being a war hero, from being someone who's been to the war, suffered the war, fought the war, to a situation where he's so nervous, he's so shivering all the time, he's so hysterical all the time, and I use the word hysteria quite carefully, that he is uh, almost shamed by the doctors who treat him. And the whole notion of hysteria is important, and this is where the two characters really come into close proximity, Mrs. Dalloway and Septimus. And the only degree of empathy that is established in a novel is between these two characters who ironically never really meet, except uh, in, in, the, in the ending scene, where the final scene where Septimus's dead body is taken away in a, an ambulance, and Mrs. Dalloway listens to the siren of the ambulance and feels a degree of pity uh, for the person inside it. Right? So, you know, that is the only uh, example of empathy in this particular novel. But interestingly, what brings Septimus uh, existentially close to someone like Mrs. Dalloway is the whole idea of hysteria. Because if you remember, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, the whole medical association of hysteria, the whole medical classification of hysteria uh, was very heavily gendered in quality. So hysteria was seen to be a disease of the womb, something which can only affect women because they happen to have a womb. So men would never be hysterics, in other words. Uh, hysteria was essentially a female malady and, and those of you who read Elaine Schroalter's book would know what that was all about. The entire politics of classifying, uh, medically classifying a certain disease and gendering it accordingly. Now, when the first world war happened, uh, and this is, I'm just giving you the context, the medical political context out of this, uh, and out of which this situation grew, which might help us in terms of situating the characters. When the first world war happened, um, you know, all the soldiers that came back from the war uh, who were essentially, you know, shivering on trauma, who was essentially uh, completely nervous breakdown, um, they were obviously being hysteric. But because the term hysteria had already been appropriated in a very gendered kind of a way, that term could not possibly be applied for the soldiers. So they were given different names, they were given different classifications, shell shop being one of them, which I mentioned already. Now, what that did essentially was that it completely exposed the inadequacy of British medical politics uh, in terms of treating uh, uh, trauma, in terms of treating abuse, in terms, in terms of treating anxiety coming out of violence. Now, this was also a time, interestingly, where Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis became more and more important uh, in, the, in this particular situation because Freud, uh, for all his worth, uh, he was someone, for the first time, he was someone who l tried to sort of make a systematic study of dreams, a systematic study of the subconscious, and who someone, uh, he was someone who wanted to uh, convey and capture the whole experience of trauma into language, uh, the language of metaphors, the language of the figurative language through which trauma could be conveyed and captured. So, this whole idea idea, this whole Freudian psychoanalysis thing which converted, which made an attempt to talk about trauma in a narrative that was important in this particular time and Freud was getting more and more traction in British psychiatry uh, post First World War. He was in London after the war. Now, with this setting in mind, this medical political setting in mind, let's sort of see what uh, this novel is trying to do. I mean, it's a very complex novel. It's one of the modern classics in world literature. Uh, it's definitely one of the finest novels written in post First World War fiction. Uh, it is about the war, but like uh, Eliot's Wasteland, the war hardly gets mentioned uh, in, in a very heavy way, except when Septimus has his traumatic visions of the war. 
he, he thinks about his friends, Smith, um, Evans, uh, people who died in the war, and there's always this degree of survivor's guilt that he suffers as a, you know, as a person who suffered the war and survived it. So those episodes uh, give very vivid and graphic details of the war, uh, but those are very sporadic details. Uh, but the rest of the novel is about the seeming gentility, the seemingly functional city in which this very genteel upper middle class Londoners think of throwing a party together with a party which, you know, would never happens really. It sort of uh, hardly takes off by the time the novel ends. So it's about the preparation for the party. But we also see the hypocrisy of the people, the hypocr hypocrisy of the upper middle class people over here. And class obviously is a very big concern. We saw how even in uh, Wasteland, uh, the class is a very big thing. I mean, that episode of um, the game of chess, for instance, where you know there's a working class conversation about sex and bourgeois uh, situation, and there's a genteel condition of loveless marriage, where you know a similar kind of setting is described using a very different vocabulary. Okay, now with that preamble uh, out of the way, let's look at Mrs. Jalloway. Uh, let's dive into the text as it were, and this should be on the screen. The text should be on the screen at the moment. So, Mrs. Jalloway by Virginia Woolf. Mrs. Jalloway said he, she would buy the flowers herself, for Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off the hinges. Uh, Rumpelmeyer's men were coming. And then thought Clarissa Dalloway, what a morning, fresh as if issued to children on a beach. Right? So, Clarissa Dalloway is the um, eponymous character, uh, the protagonist in this novel. And she's the one who's, you know, we are told over here that she decides um, and she has said that she would go out and get the flowers herself, not least because the morning seems to be quite charming in quality. What a lurk, what a plunge, for so it had always seemed to her, when with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged a burden into the open air. How fresh, how calm, stiller than this, of course, the air was in the early morning, like a flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave chill and sharp and yet for a girl of 18, as she then was, solemn, feeling as she did, standing there at the open window, that something awful was about to happen. Looking at the flowers, at the trees, at the smoke winding off them, and the rooks rising, falling, standing, and looking unto Peter Walsh, said, musing about the vegetables, was that it? A prefer meant to cauliflowers, was that it? He must have said at the breakfast one morning, when she had gone on to the terrace, Peter Walsh. He will be back from India one of these days, June or July, she forgot which, for his letters were awfully dull. It was his sayings one remembered, his eyes, his pocket knife, his smile, his grumpiness, and when millions of things had utterly vanished, how strange it was, a few sayings like this about cabbages. Now, we are already introduced to two characters over here, a tree actually, Lucy, who is uh, presumably the uh, errant girl for Mrs. Dalloway. Of course, we are introduced to Clarissa Dalloway, who is this genteel upper class woman, upper middle class woman, uh, trying to throw a party here, and hence the necessity for flowers. And more importantly, we have Peter Walsh, uh, who uh, again, who is this very almost spectral presence in this novel. He's there as well as not there. He's, he's present physically and biologically, but he never really intervenes and never really comes in or invades the novel space. But he's very much a symbolic spectral presence because he's someone who's been in a Presumably, uh, presumably, he had been in, in some capacity in India, and this is obviously Imperial India, and he's come back from India, and we're told later he's met an Anglo-Indian woman, uh, and Clarissa Dalloway doesn't quite approve of it, which obviously makes it more complicated. But here, uh, we see in this particular episode, this, this morning, it, it opens up in two different time frames. One is obviously the present time frame, which is, Mrs. Dalloway is uh, set, and the other is a time frame when she was 18 years old. And in you know, some snippets of conversations, uh, she seems to remember, uh, you know, some conversations she had with Peter Walsh about vegetables, looking at flowers and comparing flowers to vegetables. So those snippets of conversation come back to her at this point of time. So immediately, we have a series of themes at play. We have memory at play, we have mourning at play, we have the city at play, uh, and of course, we have the whole idea of existential uh, uh, feeling at play, right? So all these things are played out in a very, very politically volatile and sensitive uh, condition. Uh, the First World War, the post First World War, London, which is not quite spelled out. The political uh, sensitivity is not quite spelled out, but nevertheless, it's very much there throughout the novel. Okay, uh, and then we we talk about we we describe the the traffic, and we're given this sort of very urban description of uh, of London. Uh, and we're told that she stiffened a little on the curb, waiting for Donald's van to pass. A charming woman, Scrooge Purvis brought her, thought her, 
knowing her as one does know people who live next door to one in Westminster. A touch of the bird about her, or the jay blue-green light vivacious as though, though she was over 50 and grown very white since her illness. There she perched, never seeing him, waiting to cross very upright. For having lived in Westminster for how many years now, over 20 years, one feels even in the midst of the traffic or walking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush or solemnity of an, an, an indiscernible pose, a suspense, but that might be her heart affected, they say, by influenza before the Big Ben strikes. There, out it boomed, first a warning, musical, then the R, irrevocable. The laden circles dissolved in the air. Such fools we are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street, for heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it around one, tumbling it, creating it every moment afresh by the various fronts, the most dejected of miseries, sitting on doorsteps, drinking their, drink their downfall uh, to do the same. They can't be dealt with. She felt positive by acts of parliament for that very reason, the love life. In people's eyes, in the swing, tram and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen, shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. Now, this is obviously very, very deceptive because we, are, we, we see quite clearly how London is hardly the life-giving London. Oh, yeah, London, we very, very quickly get to see London as a mourning metropolis. But on the surface, superficially at least, it seems to be uh, a city of velocity and positivity and movement and full of life. Now, the Big Ben is a very symbolic presence in this particular uh, paragraph and it will become more, more symbolically present uh, in the course of the novel. The Big Ben, as most of you would know, is a big wall uh, clock in L London and it sort of bangs every time the hour goes uh, up. So, you know, it becomes a spectacular and iconic reminder uh, of clock time. So, the Big Ben striking is obviously a reminder of the voice of clock time playing out. Uh, and against that meta narrative of clock time, we have the whole idea of little psychological times, people crisscrossing each other, uh, people's little voices crisscrossing each other uh, in different storytelling uh, situated selves. So, people are telling each other stories, people are living stories of each other, uh, people have these little memories in which they can escape uh, from the tyranny of time uh, and all that is played out against this big backdrop of clock time, the Big Ben banging away uh, in, in very, very spectacular fashion. Okay, but uh, the impression over here, the, the setting over here is seemingly one of velocity, is seemingly one of positivity, is seemingly one of peace and prosperity and, and it is obviously very, very deceptive in quality. Uh, but Mrs. Jalloway seems to sort of say everything is good uh, with London, uh, the parliament is good, the, the motor cars, the omnibuses, the aeroplanes are good, the brass bands are good. Uh, it's, uh, it's, she loves this life in London, this moment of June, everything is like set spectacularly. But it was the middle of June. The war was over, except for someone uh, like Mrs. Foxcroft uh, at the embassy last night eating a hard up because the nice boy was killed and the old manor house must go to a cousin. Or Lady Bexborough, he opened a bazaar, they said, with a telegram in a hand. John of favorite killed, but it was over. Thank heaven, over. So again, look at the way in which uh, it is mentioned almost sarcastically. The war is over, finally. Uh, some people have got killed. Uh, some people have lost their loved ones, but that's fine, it's over. But also look at the way in which the loss of the war is described to us. Uh, so, you know, we have this example of Mrs. Foxcroft, uh, who is obviously very sad because his, her nice boy is killed and now the old manor house must go to a cousin. And this is very, very important because the whole priority, the whole focus over here is about the property. Who's going to get the property now that the son is dead, right? So, uh, this obviously shows the hollowness and the hypocrisy of the British upper middle class society at this time. Uh, but then the war is very much there as a spectral presence. It is there everywhere in London. It's like a very foggy presence which never quite goes away. Uh, but then the whole point of the war is negotiated with in a very oblique and complex fashion. So it was June. The king and the queen were at the palace. And everywhere, though it was still so early, there was a beating, a stirring of galloping ponies, tapping of cricket bats, lords, Asgard, Renelaw, and all the rest of it. So again, all this very, very masculine metaphor is important. There's a stirring of galloping ponies, which obviously suggests velocity and movement, and a tapping of cricket bats. So again, cricket bats uh, are uh, is the examples of metaphors of uh, masculine sports.
and lots ask you lots obviously um, uh, could be a cricket venue lots ask you run law um, uh, um, and all the rest of it wrapped in the soft mesh of the gray blue morning air which as the day wore on would unwind them and set down on their lawns and pitches the bouncing ponies whose forefeet just struck the ground and up the sprung the whirling young men and the laughing girls and the transparent muslins who even now after dancing all night were talking the absurdly uh, were taking the absurdly woody drugs for a run and even now uh, this are discreet old draggers were shouting out in the motor cars and errands the mystery and the shopkeepers were fidgeting in the windows with the paints and diamonds, the lovely uh, old sea green brooches and 18th century settings to tempt Americans, but one must economize, not buy things rashly for Elizabeth. And she too loving it, as she did with an absurd and faithful passion being part of it, since her people were courteous once in the times of George's, she too was going that very night to kindle and illuminate to give her party. So again, it's a long sentence which tells you again how the movements are happening around her, how everyone seems to be very jolly and very kind in spirit. Uh, and then we also get to told that, you know, we also get to know that she is also planning on giving a party. So the war is over and there's celebration and jubilation everywhere. Uh, there is this residual spectral sense of loss which is mentioned every now and then but the surface of the city seems to be uh, half moved on and also quite uh, jubilant in quality and that, that is an interesting combination. But how strange on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the home, the slow swimming happy ducks, the pouch birds waddling that, and who should be uh, coming along with his back against the government buildings most appropriately uh, carrying a dispatch, dispatch box stamped with royal arms. Who but Hugh Whitbread, uh, old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh. So w Hugh Whitbread, again, a peripheral figure, doesn't quite appear uh, strongly in the novel, but you know, she, he represents uh, one of those genteel people who's coming from one of the government buildings. Good morning to you, Clarissa, said Hugh, rather extravagantly, for they had known each other as children. Where are you off to? I love walking in London, said Mrs. Jalloway. Really, it's better than walking in the country. They had just come up, unfortunately, to see daughters. Other people came to see pictures, go to the opera, take the daughters out. The Whitbreds came to see daughters. Again, the whole idea to come to see daughters becomes a very dark, symbolic statement of the medical situation in post-war London where everyone, almost everyone has to go and see doctors on a regular basis either because someone has a physical injury or someone has a traumatic injury which he or she is trying to recover from. Times without number Clarissa had visited Evelyn Whitbread in a nursing home. Was Evelyn ill again? Evelyn was a good deal out of sorts and said he intimating uh, by a kind of uh, Pout or swelled by his very well covered, manly, extremely handsome, perfectly upholstered body. He was almost too well dressed always, but presumably had to be with his little job at the coat. That his wife had some internal ailment, nothing serious, which as an old friend, Clarissa Dalway would, would quite understand without requiring him to specify. Oh, yes, she did, of course. What a nuisance. And felt very sincerely and oddly conscious at the same time for a, for a, for a hat. You know, uh, so the whole idea of this ailing woman becomes important. Uh, uh, Hugh Woodbridge's his wife, and he seems to have some internal problem, which Clarissa Dalloway pretends to have, or is supposed to have known already, without having to be spelled out. Okay, for he always made her feel as she as she bustled on, raising his hat rather extravagantly and assuring her that she might be a girl of eighteen. Uh, and of course, he was coming to her party tonight. Evelyn absolutely insisted one a little late he might be able to, might be out of the party at a palace to which he had to take one of Jim's boys. She always felt a little skimpy beside Hugh, schoolgirlish, but attached to him, partly from having known him always, but she didn't think of him a good sort in his own way. The Richard uh, was nearly driven mad by him, and as for Peter Walsh, he had never to this day forgiven her for liking him. So Hugh Whitebread seems to be this very obnoxious white man, a bit of a know-all. Uh, and Peter Walsh is obviously coming back from the colonies. They seem to be hating each other, the very sight of it. And Peter Walsh has, uh, we, we were told away that Peter Walsh had never forgiven Clarissa Dalloway for liking Hugh Whitebread. So again, we have an array of characters already given to us. And that array is important for us to understand and unpack. Okay. Uh, And then we are told about the relationship between her and Peter. It's a very complicated relationship. We, we get a sense that they may have been romantically involved at some point in time, but obviously with time and life and circumstances of life, they moved away, they parted ways, and now Peter's back from India.
uh, and she's always been in London. Uh, so coming back from India is obviously a very symbolic kind of comeback and there are many British uh, uh, fiction and non-fiction, especially drama, uh, which has which have this uh, image of the, the, the colonial figure coming back from India and then finding it difficult to readjust in London or in England, any part of England. So one very famous play about this is uh, uh, John Osborne play, Look Back in Anger, which has this figure of the colonel coming back from India and now he's unable to understand why he isn't taken seriously anymore because, you know, this is not India anymore, this is not the Raj anymore, the Raj has come to an end, the empire has come to an end, so he will not be taken seriously. So Peter is a very complex figure, like I said, he's a bit uh, spectral in quality, it's almost like a ghostly quality about Peter. He comes in and goes whenever he wants to uh, and he asks, he's very close to uh, Clarissa Dalloway, we are told them they never got married. And you know, they do it all about the nature of the intimacy they share, the friendship that they share over the years or have shared over the years. For they might be parted for hundreds of years, she and Peter, uh, she never wrote a letter and uh, his were dry sticks. But suddenly it would come over her, if he were with me now, what would he say? Some days, some sides bring him back to her calmly without the old bitterness, uh, which perhaps was a reward for having cared for people. They came back to her in the, un in, in the middle of J St. James's Park in the morning, indeed they did. But Peter, however beautiful the day might be in the trees and the grass and the little girl in the park, Peter never saw a thing of all that. He had put on her spectacles if she had told him to, he would look. So again, we have this very empirical, blunt, non-nuanced uh, example of Peter and a very hypersensitive quality exhibited by Mrs. Dalloway and it's like a very incompatible match but they were always together for a long time. Okay, um, it was a state of the world that interests him, Wagner, Pope's poetry, people's characters ex eternally and the defects of her old soul. How he scolded her. So Peter seems to be this typical uh, mansplainer, someone who can, uh, someone who claims to have superior intellectual uh, endowment because he happens to be a man. Uh, so he thinks of big things, he likes big things like Wagner's uh, music, Pope's poetry uh, and then he also is a judge of people's characters externally and so all these are put together uh, to characterize Peter in a way which makes them uh, non-sentimental compared to Mrs. Talloway, compared to Clarissa because the whole idea of sentimentality is very conveniently mapped onto the female like hysteria. Sentimentality can be conferred and conveyed to the female and will work on most occasions rather than giving a man that brand. Okay, how they argued, she would marry a prime minister and stand on the top of the, uh, of the staircase, uh, the perfect hostess he called up, uh, she had cried over it in the bedroom, she had like, she had the makings of the perfect hostess he said. So the word hostess is obviously sarcastically used, uh, so we are imagining, we are suspecting this is a time when Peter and Clarissa had parted ways in their younger days uh, and then uh, when Clarissa had to take a decision of not going with him uh, and then this is Peter's response to it. Uh, it's a very savage response which uh, sort of sarcastically tells her that you need to be one of these politicians wives, you'll be standing on a staircase and, and having a good life which is also to say we are having a hollow and meaningless life in London. Okay. Uh, so she would still find us arguing in St. James's Park, still making out that she had been right and she had to not to marry him. So the whole idea of again it becomes a flashback back and across time uh, and then we are told that you know she thinks she's right for not having married Peter Walsh because you know some a part of her wants to feel right about it, wants to feel good about turning down his proposal. For marriage a little license, a little independence, there must be between people living together day in and day out in the same house, which Richard gave her and she him. Where was he this morning, for instance? Some committee, she never asked what. So, and she seems to enjoy a lot of independence, uh, but again, there's an irony in this, whether it's independence or detachment, we don't quite know, because as I mentioned already, this is a novel about the lack of empathy, the alienation of the human subject. So, the father, she never gets asked by her husband where she is, or she never really asks her husband where he is. That shows a degree of quote-unquote openness, flexibility, but also a sense of disconnect and alienation. So, it goes either way. Okay. Um, with Peter, everything had to be shared, everything gone into, and it was intolerable. And uh, when it came to the scene in the little garden by the fountain, she had to break to him, uh, break with him, or they would have been destroyed. Both of them ruined, she was convinced. Although she had borne about with her for years, like an arrow sticking in her heart, the grief, the anguish, and the horror of the moment when someone told her at a concert that he had married the woman met on the boat going to India. Never should she forget all that. 
cool, heartless, a prude, he called her. Never should, could, could she understand how he cared. But those Indian women did presumably silly, petty, flimsy, nincom poops. And she wasted a pity, for he was quite happy, he assured her, perfectly happy, though he had never done a thing that I talked about. His whole life had been a failure. It made her angry still. So the whole idea of Peter marrying an Indian woman uh, is, is something which enrages, uh, had enraged and still enrages Clarissa Dalloway, which is to show that maybe they had some kind of a romantic relationship at some point in time. And Peter proposed that she turned it down, but then she, when she found out he's married an Indian girl, uh, she got furious. Right? So this whole idea of the Indian girl becomes important. Again, a very pedophile, almost spectral presence. But she, the Indian woman, the Indian wife of Peter Walsh, informs his character to a large extent. Okay, and of course, the white woman's take on an Indian woman is very, very unflattering and it's almost racist in quality. Uh, she describes them as silly, pretty, flimsy, nincom poops. So, th that's the example of Indian woman according to Clarissa Dalloway. Uh, and then she's also convinced that he wasted his whole life with the marriage, he wasted his whole life with his public persona, perfectly happy, though she, he had never done a thing that it talked of. His whole life has been, had been a failure. It made her angry still. So they talked about when Clarissa and Peter were together, they talked about the aim to do many things, but they never really took off, never really happened, despite the many conversations they had. Okay. Okay. Now, the, the physical appearance of Clarissa Dalloway is mentioned. And again, uh, we see the complexity and anxiety you know, inherent in that kind of a comparison. So she would have been in the first place dark like Lady Bricksborough with a skin of crumpled leather and beautiful eyes. She would have been like Lady Lux Bricksborough, slow and stately, rather large, interested in politics like a man with a country house that very dignified, very sincere, instead of which she had a narrow pea stick figure, a ridiculous little face, big like a bird's, then she held herself well was true. That she held herself well was true and had nice hands and feet and dressed well, considering that she spent little. But how often, but often now this body she wore, uh, she stopped to take a look at the, at the dust picture. This body with all its capacities seemed nothing, nothing at all, right? So, uh, she's having self-reflections on her own in terms of her appearance, but what is important to see the life quality of this description. So, once, uh, you know, we see the workings in the brain, we see, we see the thought processes, the stream of consciousness that she is experiencing. And along with that, suddenly the reader, the, the, the narrator, omniscient narrator, stops the narrator suddenly and tells us she stopped to look at the dust picture. So, again, the time of narration and time of action seem to be coterminous with each other. They seem to be blending with each other very, very interestingly. Um, she had the older sense of being herself invisible, unseen, unknown. There being no more marrying, no more having her children now, but all this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them. Oh, Bond Street, this being P Mrs. Dalloway, not even Clarissa anymore, this being Mrs. Richard Dalloway. So again, the whole idea of the feminine identity is portrayed over here. Uh, there is no Clarissa Dalloway left, there is no Clarissa left. So her entire identity has now been consumed by her husband's identity, Mrs. Clarissa Dalloway. Right? So that, that becomes the be all and end all of her life at this moment of time. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this uh, text in the next lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.